And then all of a sudden my old pops is at the school. Talking about, hey boy, <laughs> which classroom is yours? Oh, just think of your parents just kicked in the door right now, just busted through and called you out right now. Everybody would laugh. So at a young age, I had to learn how to navigate things. I had to navigate our family not looking like everybody else's family. My dad was black, my mom was white. My three older brothers were white. Then me and my sister came along, and I don't know what politically correct is today, but back then you was called mixed. So people picked on you for being mixed. You ain't black, you're not white. You don't fit in. Look at your hair, your hair's all messed up, your hair ain't right. On both sides of the spectrum, people talk bad about us all the time. Look at your family, mixed up family. Had to navigate that. I was fortunate that I came up in that family because in our family, we didn't talk about colors. We just talked about love. For this week's episode, we have a special feature where we're bringing back King Rice, who appeared on American Reel in 2018. Today's forum will be a little different. It is King talking to several hundred high school students from our alma mater, Binghamton High, and is where my daughter Alexis now attends school. She asked King to come speak to the school for Mental Health Awareness Day and to share his story with her peers. But before I turn it over to Alexis, I want you to know my passion at American Real is to give you, the listener, a voice and to provide you with the tools you need so you can effectively master your story. Each week, I learn invaluable lessons from the stories of my guests and have packaged them up for you in a free ebook that is now available. Click on the link in this post to download your free copy today so you too can learn how to effectively master your story in 10 essential steps. And now, here's Alexis to introduce today's guest. I'm Alexis Brooks and I'm a junior at BHS. Last fall, I felt the need to help spread awareness about the importance of mental health throughout our school. As we all know, in life we are faced with conflict, difficulty, and even tragedy. Sometimes we need to seek out others to help us get through. Mental health awareness is not a topic we often discuss. One thing I learned is there are many resources available here at BHS, such as the Student Resource Center. You should not hesitate to become more familiar and utilize these services. One of the ideas to help spread awareness was to bring in a guest speaker, and I couldn't think of anyone more fitting than our guest who is with us today. King Rice was born in Binghamton and attended BHS from 1983 to 1987. He was a point guard and helped lead the Patriots to our only two back-to-back -back New York State championships in the 1984-85 and 1985-86 seasons. He was also the starting tailback on our only state championship football team in 1985. He received many honors including being named a Parade All-American, New York Mr. Basketball, as well as being named a McDonald's High School All-American. 
King Rice played point guard for the University of North Carolina Tar Heels under coach Dean Smith from 1987 until 1991. He played in 140 games, finishing his career with 629 assists, which placed him at third most all-time for the Tar Heels. Today, he is the head men's basketball coach at Monmouth University, where he took over for the Hawks on March 29, 2011. Please help me welcome Coach King Rice. I got chills right now. I'm so excited to be here. I got chills. Uh, um, I haven't been back enough, but uh, your energy is incredible. All right. I'm glad this is the format because I'm going to walk around and try to make sure I get to everybody. Even the people hiding up in the corner, I'm going to come get y'all too. All right. I'm going to come get y'all too. All right. First off, I want to thank Binghamton High School. I want to thank them for this opportunity to come back and speak with you. Um, I'm a coach, so when stuff on the floor, you always, you always pick it up, all right? You just do that, because you don't want anything to happen to your players. But I want to thank Binghamton High School for allowing me to, to come back and say hello, all right? I, I get to do this sometimes because as Alexis said, I'm, I'm a head basketball coach at Monmouth University, so I get to go places and speak to young people um, to try to get them to come to our school. Um, I get to talk to people about all, all kinds of things. But when you get to do it in your, in your hometown, it means a lot more, all right? It means a lot more. And why does it mean more to me? Okay, I remember sitting in this gym. I remember there was days when there was an assembly, and I thought there was more important things to do, okay? I thought there was more important things to do, and I might not have wanted to be here, okay, when they brought people in to, to talk to us. Some days I, I didn't want to listen, okay? I, I, I thought, ah, this isn't for me. I thought, you know, hey, I'm different. All right, I thought nobody's like me. All right, I'm from a biracial family. That was one reason I thought no, not many people were like me. Okay, so I, I walked around sometimes feeling like, I don't know why they make us do all this stuff. This isn't helping me. They don't understand. How many people feel like that sometimes? Show me by your hands. All right, so to start off, just starting off, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. You're just like me, okay? I've gotten to go on a journey that started here. And my journey has been incredible. It has been incredible. That's why I walk around smiling a lot, because my journey has it been incredible. It started off, young guy told you I was from a biracial family. Didn't know anything else but my family. Okay, my dad was 47 years old when he had me. So that means I had an old pop. That wasn't that cool. When your pop looked like he could have been your grandfather and you go around other people and they make fun of you because of that. I was just a little dude, nobody, I didn't understand why they're making fun of my pop. So it wasn't always cool being the biracial kid that had the old pops, all right? And then coming into school today, I had to get signed in, okay? I had to get signed in. Then I had to stop by the office and sign my name again. So I had to go through two times, all right, back in, Long time ago in 85, 86, when I was walking these hallways, some of these teachers were here. My father would just bust through the doors, loud talking, loud talking, wanting to talk to the teacher because I didn't do, I didn't understand my homework the night before. How embarrassing was that? Oh, old pops, I think I'm cool. 
All right? I think I'm cool walking through the halls talking junk, real cool. And then all of a sudden my old pops is at the school talking about, hey boy, <laughs> which classroom is yours? It's hard to be cool. Just think of your parents just kicked in the door right now, just busted through and called you out right now. Everybody would laugh. So that wasn't really that cool, even though I thought I was cool. So at a young age, I had to learn how to navigate things. I had to navigate our family not looking like everybody else's family. I didn't have a problem, black, white. My dad was black, my mom was white. My three older brothers were white, okay? Then me and my sister came along, and back then, I don't know what politically correct is today, but back then you was called mixed. All right, so people picked on you for being mixed. Had to navigate that. Had to navigate. People picked on you a lot. You ain't black. You're not white. You don't fit in. Look at your hair. Your hair's all messed up. Your hair ain't right. On both sides of the spectrum. Okay? People talk bad about us all the time. Look at your family. Mixed up family. All of that. Had to navigate that. Had to navigate that. I was fortunate that I came up in that family. I was very fortunate that I came up in that family because in our family, we didn't talk about colors. We just talked about love. My dad loved me a lot. That's why he kicked in the doors to try to make sure that I was getting an education. Even when I didn't want one, he made sure, he'd come to the school, he talked to everybody in town, he probably told some of your parents, if they saw me doing something wrong, that they could snatch me up and whoop me too. Because that's how it was back then. All right? I was in high school, all American in basketball, and I still got whoopings by my dad when I didn't come home on time. All right? When I was late, I'd be out with my friends. They didn't have curfew. I had curfew be all mad at my daddy. Couldn't be cool at 9.30. Everybody was gonna get cool about 11.30. I had to be home by 10. So the cool wasn't gonna happen until after I was gone. And then I'd get home and I might be one minute late and he would ground me. All right, and you gotta hear me now. I was, I was doing great in sports. I was doing all right in school. But I come home late, he would ground me. He would ground me, I'd be mad, think he didn't know, he didn't understand me, he thought he knew everything, he thought he knew everything. He never really, he never went to school, not one day. So I'm looking at him as my dad that didn't go to school that thought he knew everything, so I didn't think he understood either. How many people deal with that, that sometimes your parents don't understand you? Anybody? Okay. Sometimes they don't. All right. And I'm going to get back to he didn't understand me, but he loved me. And my mom loved me all the time. Not just me, my sister and my three brothers. So when everybody was picking on us and talking crazy, we just stayed together because our family loved each other. It didn't matter what we looked like. We lived down by Columbus Park. We were the only family that looked like that down there. And everybody thought that was, we was the group to pick on. All right? So that's how I was growing up. The part that was crazy for me is even some of my family didn't accept when my parents got together. My mom's family didn't really accept it. Took some time. Took some time for them to be okay with my parents being together. It wasn't as accepted as it is today, okay? So it was, it was a tough thing when, you, when you're different, okay? Then all of a sudden in high school, I started getting super good at sports, super good, all right? Binghamton hadn't won state championships before. That hadn't happened before. 
And when we were here, we were very fortunate that we had a group of guys that all grew up here together. And we already knew each other. And all of us thought we wanted to have a great future. And a lot of the guys that came before us, they didn't make it out. They didn't make it out. They started alcohol, drugs, not doing the right things, and the street got them. So growing up, people told me that's what was going to happen to me. The street was going to get me. But they had to understand I had this strict father at home. He wasn't going to allow that. So he went out in the streets when the streets was trying to get me. And he told everybody, you're not getting this one. You're not getting this one. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you don't get this one. All right? And he would tell me, he didn't really, he, he made me good at sports because he made me practice all the time. But the thing my father did the most was talk to me about getting an education. All right? My family, my family, my parents made $12,000 a year. Forgot to tell you that part. So that means we're on welfare. That means on the 1st and the 15th, that's when we got checks. So we got picked on for that too. They used to have a, a free cheese program. I don't know if they still have that. Hmm. A lot of grilled cheese. The grilled cheese line, not grilled cheese, the big block cheese line. Hmm was right across the street from the school. So I'm cool, I'm killing it in sports, killing it. A lot of people didn't think this could happen here. A lot of people didn't think it could happen. The guys that I grew up with, we thought it could happen. But things are going great in sports, awesome, incredible. Incredible, but my dad used to have to pick up the cheese across the street. So yeah, they had jokes about that too. They had jokes about that too, okay? And I'm telling you this story because I'm not sure what stories you've heard about me. Some are good, some I lost my mind, some I got angry, some, I acted like I didn't care. Finally, finally, things started to catch up to me. I had a dream high school deal because of sports. All right, from this high school, because of great coaches, all the way through Pee Wee, Little League, all that stuff, because of great coaches, in basketball, I became the number one ranked point guard in the United States. That kid that, that everybody picked on from Binghamton. The kid that sat here just like you that everybody said, you can't do it. The older guys from the hood told me that everybody in New York City would be better than me just because they're from New York City. I thought to myself, well, they better be practicing awfully hard because I do this for real. And nobody's stopping this. Not New York City, not anybody is stopping this. Okay, because I had my head in the right place that I was making the pros. I was making the pros so I could take care of my family. That family that everybody picked on. Okay, so I was going to take care of them because of sports. I was going to do that. I was raised to do it. I was born to do it. I was named to do it. It all had lined up. I worked to do it. I had people in the town pushing me to do it. And crazy thing happened. I kind of fell in love with that. I fell in love with everybody saying, hey, he's the guy from Binghamton that's going to do it. 
He's the guy. This kid right here is going to do it. He's going to make it. Then even the older guys from my hood started saying, yo, you might, you might make it. Okay, and I fell in love with that. And then I didn't always handle it the right way. It's addictive when everybody knows you and everybody's pumping you up and everybody's telling you how great you are. I just was the, the mixed kid that was poor that you was laughing at. Now everybody's on my side and pumping me up and I'm gonna be the greatest and all this stuff. And it was really cool. It was cool for me. It was cool for my teammates. It was really, really a cool time. Okay? And when I, when I got it, started feeling myself a little bit, I started making different decisions. See, I was pure. I was pure. Never drank, never smoked. Wanted to kick it, dad wouldn't let me, so I got a lot of rest too. And everybody kept pumping me and pumping me and it was cool. But then all of a sudden, for some reason, I thought, hey, this is cool, but maybe everybody else drinks. Everybody else does it. I've said no this long. Can't be that big of a deal. They all seem to have fun when they do it. Now, when I was a sophomore, I told on my teammate for drinking because he broke the rule. He was a starter. Then he didn't start anymore. As a grown up, he became a police officer and we're very close friends. He texts me all the time. He, he has not texted me one time where he doesn't mention where, and he was a senior, where when I was a sophomore, I told on him about drinking. Told on him. Quick told on him too. Some of y'all might call that uh, Snitching, ha <laughs> snitching. <laughs> guess what? If y'all did something to me right now, guess who I'ma tell on? Y'all, <laughs> I'll tell on you quick. I'll be the first one to tell. They'll, I'll tell on you twice, all right? Cause they done tricked everybody. They tricked everybody into saying, don't tell. That makes you a snitch. And then you go to jail <laughs> and they stay out. When you was a kid, you wouldn't have went for that. Somebody say, hey, give me your bike and I'm gonna keep it and then you don't have a bike no more. You would have said, nah, I ain't doing that. All right, but as we get older, we get talked into stuff. We watch other people and then we start thinking, hey, this might be okay. This might be okay to do. Well, that's what happened with me. After I snitched, after, all right, when I did snitch, we won the state championship, just so everybody understands. We won the state championship. We probably would have won it anyways, but then everybody on our team stopped drinking because they knew the young guy on the team would tell on them. Okay, so I had an impact with them. But then I got older, and as I said, everybody thinking it was, it was sweet for me all the time and telling me how great things were going and how great I was. And as a young person, you don't need to hear that all the time. You don't need to hear that all the time because I fell in love with that part of it. And then nah, I took advantage. That's why I'm back speaking to you. But I started drinking. I started drinking and it was just a little bit at first, all right? end of my senior year, a couple wine coolers, stuff that almost tasted like Kool-Aid, okay? And I would have one or two of them and I would throw up all over the place and my sister would be like, boy, please don't let dad find out. And she would pray with me <laughs> and rub my back as I was getting sick. And I should have known right then that's not for me. I should have known right then. I should have walked and, and went right back to the kid 
that was just going to make the pros. I should have went back to that right then, as soon as I threw up the first time. That told me right there, this ain't for you, man. This is not for you, man. But I was very competitive. And everybody else could do it. Why can't I do it? I can beat them at everything. So I can beat them at drinking too. So then I kept drinking. Then I went away to college. Even before I went away to college, I had never been in trouble. I used to get in a little scrap here and there. When you think you're so cool, people want to try you. I got beat up a few times and I won some a few times. Okay? But once I started drinking, other things started coming into my life. Then I was the first time I got in trouble. Bunch of kids, high school kids, on teen night, on teen night, where they used to close the bar down and let the teenagers go for one night. For one night, you got to do that. Well, one of the nights, we were all out. I had some drinks, and a big fight broke out. We weren't involved in it at all, was not involved. But the police officer said, hey, you guys need to go. And we didn't. We're the star basketball guys. We don't have to move when you say officer. They didn't tell us to move again. They just started grabbing guys. They just started grabbing guys. So now I was a high school All-American and then I got arrested. Then I got arrested being drunk. <laughs> embarrassed my family, embarrassed myself, embarrassed my coaches, embarrassed my friends, embarrassed everybody in this town because I got arrested. That wasn't supposed to be the path I was on. But all of a sudden, that's the path I was on. And a funny thing happened once that arrest happened. I almost, I almost didn't get to go to North Carolina and play basketball. So the thing that I was, I was born and bred to do, that was the first time that I almost messed it up. That was the first time my choices got in the way. And then what did I do? I blamed the police officers. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't messing with them. And then, once it happened once, all of a sudden, I'm the angry kid all of a sudden. I told you I was the guy that smiled and thought I was cool. Now I get arrested. Some people that I thought were in my corner weren't really in my corner. And if you believe people when they're telling you you're great, I'm a firm believer, then you have to believe them when they're telling you that you're not. So I had to take that. But as a kid, when people weren't in my corner that I thought were in my corner, turned me into a real angry guy. And I walked around mean mugging. I walked around cussing all the time. I walked around saying, I don't care. It don't matter. Nobody could whoop me though, all right? And from when I was that senior year until I was 27, I probably drank more alcohol than it's safe for probably 15 people to drink, okay? I thought I was good at sports. I really competed hard to be good at drinking. And it was that first time when I threw up, I should have known because by continuing, by continuing to drink, my journey went real dark. I wasn't as good at ball anymore. I wasn't handling my business like I was supposed to. 
and I probably didn't realize it. I was probably pretty depressed because it was the first time in my life where I wasn't successful. First time. I always won. And now all of a sudden I'm not winning and I'm drunk most of the time. Drunk most of the time. It kept making me more and more mad and I just kept making more and more excuses. This was not supposed to happen. It was not supposed to happen. I was supposed to make the pros, all kinds of things. And I kept getting in my way because I kept drinking. My mom told me it was in my family. My coaches knew it was in my family. And everybody tried to tell me not to do it. But that's when me being stubborn and hard-headed and thinking I knew everything, I got this. This isn't a problem. I don't have to do it. I do it because I like to do it. And I'm going to keep doing it till I don't want to do it. Nobody was going to tell me. My life just kept getting worse and worse. And when I was a kid, people made excuses for me. Ah, he's young. He made a mistake. Ah, he's young. Ah, he's young. Ah, he's young. Well, then you're not young anymore. Now you're the guy that's drunk, that keeps making mistakes, that a lot of people are counting on you to get your stuff together, and you just can't get out your own way. So it was dark. It was dark. And I was very, very fortunate for my girlfriend at the time. Okay? Because she saw something special in me even when I was drinking that much. She thought something good could happen even when I kept doing wrong. And she stayed with me and stayed with me and stayed with me and I wasn't fun to be around. I wouldn't come home when I was supposed to. I just, you don't treat the person that you care about the way I was treating her. And she kept staying with me. And she kept staying with me. And I used to ask her, why do you like me so much? Why? I don't do right. And she just keep telling me, I love you, boy. And we're going to be all right. So after nine years of drinking and totally, totally, totally messing up my basketball career because I did not make the pros, Okay, I did not make the pros. I got close, even with all the anger and drunk and all that stuff. I almost did, but I didn't quite get there. Okay? But what I learned along the way is that because I dreamed so hard, I dreamed so hard to make the pros, that where I landed, was a college graduate with an opportunity, with an opportunity, in my mind, fix some of the things that I messed up when I was a kid. Um, but there was an opportunity there for me to still do all the things I wanted to do. And if you remember, I wanted to take care of my family because they took such good care of me. And they loved me so much when I was a young fella. And they sacrificed so much. I didn't even understand it when they were doing it. They sacrificed so much for me to have an opportunity. An opportunity to make something of myself. So after nine years of thinking I could drink with the best of them. I was driving home one night and I got pulled over. Got pulled over. And I'm thankful for that day. All right, October 26. Thankful for that day. I'm thankful that those police officers pulled me over. 
I'm thankful for that because if they didn't, see, I don't think, I'm not one of those guys that say, wow, well, I have made it home. Woo, I made it. If they didn't stop me when they did, who knows what would have happened? Who knows what would have happened? I don't want to hurt anybody, but by getting behind the wheel, one, I deserve to get stopped. I deserve to get stopped because if you'll do something that reckless, you deserve to get stopped. You deserve to go to jail if you will do that. What I didn't understand was I was putting everybody else in danger. I was putting everybody else in danger. God forbid if I would have fell asleep. God forbid if I would have ran a light. God forbid if I would have hit somebody. God forbid if I would have did one of those things because I would have never been able to live with that. That would have crushed me. So I'm thankful for that police officer that stopped me that night because it slowed me down enough that night sitting in the jail cell in Bloomington, Illinois, crying, crying like crazy. And I just said, yo, bro, you're way better than this. You keep messing up, man, and you're not a bad dude. You keep messing up. You got so many people on your team, and you keep messing up. But you never mess up when you're not drinking. You've never had a problem when you're not drinking. So that night in the cell, I decided right then, never going to drink alcohol again. Well, now it's been 22 years, okay? And now, and now I'm on the, the bright side of that darkness. Now I'm on the bright side of it. Now I get to, I get to be a good husband. I get to be a good dad. I get to be a good son, good brother, better brother. Um, I've, I've bought, and, bought my mom and dad a house. So, Got that done. Then I bought my mom a different house when my dad passed. Bought my mom a different house down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And she's doing as well as she's ever been doing since my dad passed. Since I was the first one in my family to go to college, now my sister's gone. Her daughter's gone. My son is going to Bucknell University next year to play basketball. And my young guy who's seven years old, he's probably gonna be the best athlete out of everybody in our family. So I, I, I was so excited to come today because when you're young, okay, I would trade with you. I would trade with you right now. And I'm very fortunate. I got a great job. I got a great boss. I get to do what I love to do. But I would trade with every one of you kids right now just to be a kid again. Now, I would hope that I get to bring some of my knowledge back with me, okay? Because being a kid is the best part. You guys right now, you get to find out who you are. You get to change the world. You get to do that. I'm 50 years old right now. I don't know if I'm changing the world that much anymore. I'm kind of scared about stuff. I worry about stuff. And when you're young, I didn't, I didn't worry about the things I worry about now. So I encourage you. I encourage you. Enjoy this time. Enjoy having close friends. Enjoy learning about people that aren't like you. 
Instead of not liking them, learn about them. Find out why they look at you funny. Instead of being mad and going and doing something for them looking at you funny, maybe you start a conversation. Maybe you ask them how their day is going. See, because every one of you in here is different. You can have your tightest friend. Me and Rick Coleman, we are as tight as any kid in this school. But we were different. And he had my back and I had his back 100% of the time. But we were different. And that's what makes us us. Please, if there's problems, talk to your friends. Talk to your teachers. Talk to someone that you don't know. Just say, how you doing? Strike up a conversation. Because walking around mad, it's not good for anybody. You limit yourself if you walk around not wanting to learn about other people. See, I've grown a lot because as I've gotten older, I got to travel. I've gotten to see the world through a broader, broader spectrum. I never left Binghamton until I was about 15 years old, 14 years old, I got to go to Syracuse for camp. And that was like the coolest thing ever. Okay, so I only knew the world like this. Okay, so when people looked at me funny that didn't look like me, then I, I might have had a problem with them. Shouldn't have had a problem with them. I should have asked them why they have a problem with me. And striking up conversations, striking up conversations has led me to be able to smile instead of mean mugging. Okay, mean mugging, walk around. <laughs> All that does is draw somebody else that their mean mug is harder than yours. And then their mean mug being harder than yours where you're not going to think that. So now the two mean mugging people are going to get into it and then both of them are going to get kicked out of school. And now they're limiting what they can do. Now they're limiting what they can do. So I, I want to... I want you to ask some questions in a minute, but I, I want you to know how, how cool this is for me. All right, I want you to know that it inspires me that I, I get the chance to talk to you. And I've, I've, I've learned along my way that love and appreciation of our differences make us all better people. So if anybody is ever struggling, all right, my darkness lasted for nine years. I lost jobs, all kinds of stuff, where I thought I was gonna be the head coach before I was able to, but because of things that I did when I was younger, I didn't get the job. But I just kept plugging away and I was not going to let that make me go back to a dark place. I was not going to let that happen again. It got me one time. It got me one time and I was fortunate that I had good people around me that kept believing in me, kept believing in me, and I was able to get through. So if you are ever feeling down, if you ever not thinking you can make it. Please, please talk to somebody. Okay, I talk more to my friends now, and now we really have each other's back. Now we're not just covering for each other anymore. Now we really, as men, talk to each other about men things. Now my friends will tell me when I'm not spending enough time with my sons. Now my friends will tell me when I'm not handling my business on the level that they know that I want to handle it. 
My friends will tell me if I'm not treating my wife the way they know that I want to treat her. And that's how we really hold each other down now. If I'm about to do something that they know I don't really want to do, they're going to say, hey, bro, don't do that. Okay, because they want to help me be the best me that I can be. That's what a true friend will do. If people are trying to get you to not be true to yourself, I don't know how, how tight they are with you. If they're leaning on you to do things that you're not cool with, and then they try to heat lamp you into doing it, I don't know if they, they're the best people to be around. All right, yesterday I was with the girls team at Monmouth and a couple of their girls, we had a banquet, a couple of their girls are mad at their coach. And they started on the, our coach this and our coach that. And I said, whoa, 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 ladies, let me tell you something. I'm on 100% positive. I am on 100% positive. And I'm not letting you put any of that negativity or dirt on me. And I just started wiping it off. And I said, when y'all don't want to be negative, I'll help you be better basketball players. Now, they can be mad at me. They can have their opinion on whatever they want. But I'm not allowing somebody else to bring their negative energy to mess my deal up. I worked through a lot of stuff to get here. All right? My sons look at me now as, like, they're proud that I'm their dad. My wife walks with her head high all the time. I've been a head coach for nine years. All right? Eight years. I'm starting my ninth. And I have a contract extension in my car right now for another five years. All right? So with that, as soon as I sign, that poor kid from Binghamton that used to sit here, that didn't want to come, as soon as I sign my name to that paper, they owe me about $2.5 million to do, to do what I love to do and to do what everybody in this town helped me get to and to do <laughs> all the things that I thought my father raised me for. So now I'm going to continue to stay positive, to talk to my friends when I'm struggling. My season this year, I started 0-12. And doubt started to creep in. Maybe I'm not good at this. Maybe somebody else would be a better coach for these young men. So you can have thoughts that aren't the most pure. That doesn't mean that's who you are. All right? I started believing maybe I'm not a good coach because we kept losing games. No, I'm a super coach, or I wouldn't be there being the coach. We just happen to be losing games at the start of our season. So if I can leave you with anything, if you have thoughts, that doesn't mean that's who you are. Sometimes my thoughts, I get mad at my kids, my guys on my team, and I want to, it doesn't mean I don't love them. That just means something came in my head that wasn't pure, and I try to get it out as quickly as possible. If it stays, then I talk to my coaches so they can help me get it out of my head as quickly as possible. Okay? So please, if anything pops in there, that doesn't mean that's who you are. You have a negative thought. That doesn't mean you're a negative person. You just had something hit your brain, and now it's gone. You don't have to act on them. You don't have to act on them. And if you will do something that I wasn't able to do at your age, if anything happens, quick, 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 just something jumps out at you. Somebody starts something. Somebody swings on you. Anything. Somebody broke in your locker. Somebody talked about your mother. Whatever it could be. Take seven seconds. Seven, because that's just enough time for, for you to think 
and calm down and not let that person mess you up. Because that's all it does. People will talk and go, oh, he was scared. He was this. He was that. He can't fight. He can't this. He ain't cool no more. But you know what they won't say is he got kicked out of school. Because when you get kicked out of school, all your friends, when you the one outside the school, they talking about you then. Your friends the one, damn, he dumb as hell. He ain't even in school no more. Fool. <laughs> your own friends, that's the main ones that will be talking bad and reckless about you when you are the one that's out. Okay, your own people that you think are your people, they'll be the main ones talking bad about you. So take that seven seconds and to protect yourself. All right, to protect yourself. You might be the toughest person. You might be good with your hands. That gets you kicked out of school too. You might not want to listen. Well, I didn't want to listen to those police officers that night and that's the first time I got arrested. All I had to do was listen to them and move and I wouldn't have went to jail and none of my friends would have went to jail either if we just listened. If we would have taken that seven seconds and said, hey, this is a police officer, he told us to move, he can put us in jail, we don't want to go there. And then I wouldn't have went to jail. And then maybe my nine years of anger and drinking might not have happened. And then maybe my journey would have even been better. Once again, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. I am you, okay? I sat here, I had to listen to them. I used to do square dancing right here on this floor, right here. Yeah, don't think I wasn't good at it. We used to complain at first when we had to do it. But then Reg, me, Rick Coleman, then all of a sudden, we turned it into the coolest part. Some of us couldn't swim though, so when we had swim class, they didn't want to do that part. And Mr. Dinehart used to work with us. He used to beat us up in the back, and we, we wouldn't have to swim every day. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. If I could ever do anything to help you, I 100% will do that. There's somebody sitting out there, you're going to change the world, all right? And you're going to come back, and you're going to talk to some kids 25 years from now, and they're going to be looking at you like, why? Why we got to listen to them? All right, go out there and change the world. A lot of people from here, I see all over the country when I'm traveling, going to watch games. It's something about being from Binghamton. I know you guys are tough kids, all right? I know you're tough kids because you're from Binghamton. And uh, last thing is I love all of you and I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. I will see y'all hopefully soon. Does anybody have any questions? I know y'all probably ready to go. Any questions? Anybody? Hang on, y'all, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. If there's any questions, I see my man raised his hand over here. What's your name, bro? I don't want to ask no more, no. Nah, come on. Uh, my name is Todd Kyle. You ever got dunked on before? The question is, have I ever been dunked on? Okay, if you a real baller, you've been dunked on before. And I was a real baller. I got dunked on at Duke on national TV. I had called all my friends and was like, yo, we on against Duke tomorrow. Come watch, watch, watch. And back then, all the games weren't on like now. So we had the CBS game. And I was young. And I, my man went away. And I kept following him like this. And I got to here and I remembered. And I came back and I got to about right here and Robert Bricky, his, his man section hit me in the forehead. <coughs> That's what happened. The lesson to that was I should have stopped like I was taught 
in the right spot, then I wouldn't have got dunked on. But I, I didn't remember that I was supposed to stop and not foul my guy. Therefore, I got dunked on. Uh, Robert Bricky was one of the biggest dunkers. And I was not that. So I got there late and I just had to take that one. Just had to take that one. My man right here. Was I dunking on people in high school? No. Nope. No, I, what I did was I, I made our team win. That's, that's, we won in football and basketball. But I made our team win. We didn't care who, who scored the most points. That's it. And uh, I had one dunk. I dunked on one dude at Seton. And it was a lot of fun. Right here. Why did, I, why did I decide to come talk to you? Well, first off, it's always cool for me to come home. I am true Binghamton, Binghamtonian, all right? I grew up here, I love it here. Um, I come home as often as I can. Um, but the, the main reason that I did this today is I'm very good friends with Roger Brooks and his daughter, Lex, I've known her since she was young, young, and she called me last week and said, King, um, we're having a thing at the school and we would love for you to come. And I said, yeah, right then. And then she said, well, I, 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 and I said, no, Lex, I'm coming for sure. So that's why I'm here. Question number two. Can I hit the, that one? But can y'all, can y'all hit the, can y'all hit the, uh, can y'all hit the, I got some dances, but I ain't gonna do them today. What's the other question up here? Excuse me? Yes, he, the question was, could I have gone to college for football? Yes, I could have. Uh, the main schools recruiting me were Notre Dame, Penn State, Syracuse, uh, Ohio State, Tennessee were the main ones. And Tennessee used to have cheerleaders call my house all the time. My mom didn't like that too much. Right here. My career high uh, at Carolina, I want to say it was uh, 27 points and 15 assists. Um, that was my highest in high school. I'm not sure what it was. Up here. Yep. What school was for basketball? For basketball, pretty much everybody in the country. My final five schools were North Carolina, Syracuse, Providence, Notre Dame, and NC State. Um, but everybody in basketball, Duke, yep, Duke was recruiting me hard. Um, Georgetown, everybody, back like St. John's, all the Big East schools, ACC, up here. Say that again. What was my greatest one? My greatest accomplishment? Wow. Um, probably, you mean in sports? When I was a kid, it probably was making the McDonald's All-American game um, because everybody from here said that I couldn't do it. And then the number two uh, thing sports-wise is playing in the Final Four when I was at North Carolina, starting in the Final Four. And then my biggest is having kids and have being a good, good uh, husband and father. My man in the red. My inspiration, my father. Um, guys, I'll tell you, I was, I didn't understand him all the time because he was so strict. And, and then when I say straight guys, I would score three or four touchdowns in the game. And the next morning, he would have me up at about seven in the morning doing push-ups because somebody, one guy tackled me by himself. Um, yeah, my pops. He came to my basketball practices. And if I didn't dominate every day, then the next morning I would be up in the morning and he would be, he'd get me up at around six. and wonder what was wrong because I, I didn't dominate practice. So, but he was the reason that I, I became the man that I am today. Up here.
The best defensive players, do they get dropped at least once? Hey, you could be the best defensive player and you can get dropped, all right? If you play ball, sometimes somebody's gonna get you. But that, that doesn't, the, the thing is right now, people, people fall down and the person that makes them fall down don't make the shot. That, 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 you gotta make the shot. So if you make somebody fall and you miss, you didn't get the job done. Get the bucket, and then you could at least smile at them. Why do you pick NC State over everything? No, not NC State, brother. University of North Carolina. Um, one, I was a point guard, and most of their point guards went to the pros. And two, the opportunity to play for Dean Smith um, was too, too good to pass up. Over here again. Do I still got it? Um, I, I, no, I, I, there's no, there's no lying. See, when I, I don't play a lot, but I practice with my team sometimes and I set the rules up. So when I set the rules up, I'll bust you up. If we just, uh, if we just came out here right now and you got the ball, no, I could not guard you. But if I got the ball, and it was in my practice, I would outplay you. Up top. Could I still shoot a little? I shoot better now than I did when I played. I wasn't the best shooter. Nah, we good on that. They don't, we good on that. Nah, don't worry guys. I don't, one thing, I, I'm not gonna get embarrassed. All right, I don't get embarrassed. My son wishes I got embarrassed. I usually do the embarrassing. Um, because I'm, I'm very happy with who I am, so people talk bad about me. Um, it, don't, it just rolls off now because I'm good with who I am, so I don't get embarrassed. If I shot an air ball and y'all laughed, I, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, I shot an air ball. I've shot them before. Any, any life questions? Is anybody here struggling with alcohol? Okay, right here. Why not? I'm sharing, I'm sharing with you about mine. Right here. Yeah. Hang on, y'all. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on, y'all. Hang on. If you would have if you would have went to college for football instead, would you would have like gotten a certain thing Do you think it would have changed? Um I don't know. I, I really, see, I think I, at some point I thought, because my friends, see, I, I played JV basketball in the eighth grade. So all the people I hung out with were juniors and seniors, all right? And then at the end of my JV year, they moved me up to varsity. So like all the guys on the varsity were really the guys I hung out with. And they were, they were into things and I thought they were cool. So that's why when I got a little older, I tried some of those things. I probably would have still tried, um, but maybe I would have caught it sooner. Anything else? Over here. What was my favorite part about BHS? Yeah, all right. See, this is one of those honest questions. You said, well, what is it? What, what are we going to say it in front of them? All right. Uh, now, you got to remember now, he asked me, what was my favorite part about BHS? I'm not going <laughs> to. All right. We, uh, we always had the prettiest girls at Binghamton High School. So that was. That's what I liked when I was 17, 15. I thought that was, that was pretty cool. All right, I don't, I, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I'm honest all the time. Anything else? Hey, let me tell you, you guys have been amazing. All right, I know, trust me, I, I understand when you get to come in here, it might be cool to get out of class for a little while, but you guys have been amazing. And now I'm going to turn it back over to whoever it is. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you guys. Really appreciate you.
Here's some never before seen footage of King Rice taking me to the building where he grew up. Not a lot of good memories in this building. So what floor were you on? We were on the first floor, well actually second floor on that to side. the left. Yeah. And you don't know it, but you can't tell from here that there was four bedrooms in there. So it was a four bedroom apartment. Wow. Uh, the part that has the front where the windows are right here, the shingles, that's not brick. That used to be open, so you had a porch. Porch. So my parents could sit out here. Right. Or my mom could, or if it was time to come home, she could just come out and scream, and we would always be. <laughs> it, it looks different now, um, but there was always the sandbox over there with stuff that you could climb up on, some monkey bars. There was a pool right here in the front that had a fountain. Uh, and then uh, the building had different paintings on it. Um, well, other than that, it's, the wall was always cool because all the older guys got to sit on the wall. And when you got older, you thought you were cool when you got to sit on the wall with them. And Rod, remember when we used to play St. Mary's soccer over in the field? That's right. Okay. That's right. When we was little Rod and little kids. That's right. <laughs> That's over right. In the field. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then basketball in that gym. Yeah. Grammar school. Yeah. Grammar One school. Team. This was like the spot. There, there's so many stories because. Now there's a buzzer on the door. Well, that, that happened because my dad, because in the wintertime, everybody, this is where you hung out and this was the building. So we would be in the house and people would be sitting all in the hallway and it would be loud. And my dad would come open the door and everybody would run out and he would get frustrated. So then he would get hot water and he would tell them get out the hallway and when they want it, and they stay loud, he would get the hot water, and then he would just open the door and throw in everybody and run out. He's like, come on, Mr. Rice, come on. He's like, y'all stay out, my kid's trying to sleep. When I was growing up in this park, I was one of the kids, you know, and it made me very competitive, uh, but I was getting that from home also because I had three older brothers. Um, but every day I lived across the street, what a blessing. Yeah. I could run out, my parents could see me, and I just got to totally, totally become a little athlete which I didn't like all the time, but I had a great father who, who had a vision for me to, to be able to go to school. So, and that's what he wanted. So there was days out there when I said all the ladies were praying for me because I would be crying and he would be making me work out. And all the ladies would say, Rice, you can't do that. And he would say, this is my son. I can do how I want to do it with my son. And, uh, he tied my arms, right hand up, because I wouldn't dribble with my left, and everybody was looking and laughing, and my buddies would pick on me about it. But then, you know, now the court's named after me because of how my brothers did, how my mom did, how my dad especially, and then as I said, the community, anything that was bad that was happening, everybody in the community kept it away from me every single person, all the time. When I got older and thought I was cool and could get into some stuff, every single time they made me get away from it. And that's just, that's love, that's, that's a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm on this journey right now, I don't know. I got a lot of questions why I get this. Why do I get to be a head basketball coach? Why do I get to take these trips and go find families that kids have the same dreams that I have? Okay, so I don't have the answers, but I do know I should appreciate where I come from. I got a lot of people looking up to me. I don't always see it that way um, because I know I got a long way to go. So when people are saying you're doing a lot of good things, I think, thank you. But I have a lot of more things, I'm, a lot of things I'm supposed to be doing because it doesn't feel like I'm done yet. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. At American Real, we're on a mission to help as many people around the world fulfill their dreams and obtain their goals. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle, or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses.
courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.